Death, The Final Stage of Growth by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross details the fact that we are a death-denying society. And that may be the case, but as Stephen Garrett points out, there are more than 900,000 people in British Columbia over the age of 65 who are going to die, and pretty soon. Garrett says we're woefully underprepared. We're underprepared emotionally, psychologically, and sociologically for the inevitable. He says that means people are going to be angry, scared, alone, and frequently unattended to by healthcare services that will be overwhelmed. He has a clear idea about what you can do to come to grips with passing on and doing so in a responsible manner. Coming to grips with death, he says, is one thing. Being prepared emotionally, financially, legally, and attending to your health care needs, well, that's another, and it's your responsibility to address these issues. We invited Stephen Garrett of the Memorial Society to join us for a conversation that matters about heading over the horizon without regrets and having your affairs in order. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thank you, Stu. Thanks for joining me. And uh, on a topic that some people will go, what? You're going to talk about death? <laughs> Why are you going to talk about death? Why is it so important? And, and I know that, you know, in the course of my lifetime, which is pretty similar to yours, there was this tendency of like, no, 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 we, we want to shove it to the side, pretend it's not going to happen. Yeah. Where are we at with that right now? Are we still shoving it to the side? You bet we are. There's <laughs> 83% of us are shoving it to the side. We just don't want to look at it. Why? Just, what are we afraid of? I don't know, Stu. It's kind of like the, this table that we're sitting around. There's an end to it. Yeah. And what's beyond it, we don't know. And I think that's part of the problem is we don't know what's beyond our human life, so we get afraid of it. What, as in... You know, is there is there kind of an ego component? I'm not here. Sure. I'm not making a difference any longer. It doesn't matter that I lived it, because I think that that is the fear. When I die, all of a sudden, it didn't matter that I lived. Yeah. But I don't think that that's true. It. Uh, I think it's a bit the other way around. The ego wants to live. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't want to die. It's got this energy and it. it wants to carry on. Right. It know it's not going to, and so our ego helps push away the. The certainty of death. Well, and that's tied in with the autonomic responses yep. that are built in biologically so yep. that we breathe and our heart beats and yep. so on. And we stay uh, alive of course and survive. Wanna, you know, a couple of weeks ago I had a futurist in and I'm going, so how close are we to the singularity? And he goes, it's not going to happen. And I said, come on, you got to be an optimist. I want to be able to take whatever I've learned in this life and download it into some other existence and live for a, a few hundred more years. But I also recognize that this vehicle ain't going to make it there. That's right. You may, the one you are, your essence or your spirit or your divine self, whatever you want to call it, that may, but this won't for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's what frightens people is this goes what's left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that what is left is the uh, influence that you've had on other people. And so yes. you live on through the actions that you live today. Like yeah. I, I think that actually coming face to face with the concept of dying uh, allows us to see that absolutely everything that we do actually has meaning because our presence here on earth influences change. And once in motion, that doesn't go away. Yep. You know, like the laws of thermodynamics is once that energy is in movement, uh, it's going to keep moving. Exactly. Uh, there may be entropy, but it's not going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right, but we don't know that for sure. I mean, the questions people ask me on their deathbed is, you remember me next year on my birthday? Did I do any good for you in your life? They wonder about those very things because they're just not sure. Well, are we not teaching the right lessons then? Because when you say that, I, my response to somebody would be, I don't need to re consciously remember you because you have changed me. By yeah. virtue of the fact that I know you, I am no longer who I would have been Bingo. before I met you. So I didn't meet you before today, but after this conversation, after now, I, I have changed. The course of my life has changed. That's correct. And I will carry you with me for the rest of my life. And yep. so will people that I interact with, even though they never met you. So yep. I, I think that we've got to get away from this idea, like, will I be remembered? Is there a statue? Is there a plaque with my name on yep. it? But you and I are very different in our outlook. Most of us 
hold it the different way. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at the unwashed masses, so to speak. <laughs> but we've been taught that way. Yes, we have. Uh, and so what do you think we need to do psychologically to start to prepare? Because let's face it, the numbers suggest that people in our generation uh, forward we're all going to die here in the next 30 years. Yeah, we're heading out. And that's a lot of people in British Columbia. 916,000 people in BC currently are over the age of 65. 916,000. Wow. Like that's, <laughs> that's a lot. It's probably about a third of the population yes. of the province, isn't it? That's accurate. Are yeah. we, you know, we talk about being psychologically prepared. So let's finish that thought and then come yeah. along and, and say, well, what do we have to do individually to be prepared? Yeah. And what do we have to do as far as the resources as far, uh, when it comes to health care and even the services that yeah. are going to be provided for people who are dying? Yeah. Psychologically, what are the things that, that you believe for people who are sort of over the 60-yard line oh, in yeah. life? What, are the, what do we need to do to start to say, okay, how do I ensure that I feel that I have uh, created the kind of meaning in life that will make my life matter. First thing I gotta do is I've gotta accept the fact I'm gonna die. And not kind of accept it intellectually, mm -hmm. but just, you gotta get it. That, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I know, I know, <laughs> Stu. I, and I talk to yeah. a lot of people, and I have for years about this topic, but that's the only way in, mm -hmm. is to really get the fact that one of these days, you and I aren't gonna be here. And to get it viscerally in the body, because it's the body that's gonna die. Yes. That's a big ask, and it mm -hmm. takes a lot of courage to do that. But what I've noticed is those of us who do that, okay, whew, yep, I am. And then we get on with our life. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. Awesome. Thank you. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this. Well, was it easy for you to do that? No. Because, I mean, you're talking about it from the, from the perspective of having crossed that line. Yes. Uh, and as you're talking about it, I'm going, uh, you're right, intellectually, I'm there, I get it. Yeah. Uh, psychologically and emotionally, I'm still denying it. So what happened for me, if I can give you a short story, yeah. I've had three significant deaths in my life. My sister died in 1988, May the 5th, Thursday night, 6.32 in the evening. Well, she was young, huh? She was young. She was 36. My dad died in 2004. My brother died three years ago. Mm -hmm. Each of those deaths, because they're my DNA, they're my people, they're my family, right. had a profound effect on me. Mm -hmm. My personal genius was I let myself be affected. And I let myself accept the fact that, who, as I'm lowering Jody into the ground in a casket, it could be me. Mm -hmm. And more than it could be me, it will be me. When my brother died three years ago, he had a six-year walk with cancer. I sat by his bedside as he was dying. Mm -hmm. <sighs> it's hard to do that for two reasons. Right. He's dying, and I know I'm going to be dying sometime. Mm -hmm. And so I've had this physical... Huh reality to, to, to my ultimate death. So when your sister died, and yes. I asked this from my own personal experience, when I was 20 years of age, my mother died. Yeah. And I thought, if all you do is die, what's the point of anything? <laughs> I, I, it yeah. was a real existential yeah. moment for me. I get that. Uh, and I went on a long journey trying to figure out, you know, why does anything matter? And I've come to accept that virtually everything matters. Yeah. But I was 20 and I thought, well, I'm not going to die. I'm not, I'm not dying. Like, yeah. and, and so that's more than 40 years ago and I'm still alive. And so I was right about that. So when your sister dies, it probably didn't have quite the same impact on you as when your brother passed away. Correct. Because I'd done some changing and growing along the way. Right. My sister was the um, fire in my belly to quit my job as a Bay Street stockbroker and become a social worker and a humanist. My brother's death, wow. um, yeah, my brother's death three years ago really shook me up because when I asked him on his deathbed, and this is a hard question to mm -hmm. ask a brother, I said, so why four rounds of chemo? Why three rounds of radiation? Why did you do stent, like why? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, after some breathing and some, because I was asking him a hard question. Right. He said, Stephen, I'm 61 years old. Mm -hmm. I didn't live my life as fully as I know I could have, and I deeply regret that. Oh. Right? That's a really hard lesson. So what held him back? He was afraid. He was afraid to be himself. 
he was afraid to let go. He was afraid to use his voice because we've all been trained to fit in. And so in that moment, though, when he is actually facing death, he's saying that fear was, was a mistake. Absolutely. Wow. And all, all I could do with my brother, I mean, that's a sad deathbed mm-hmm. regret. Yes. I just held him and we curled up on his bed and cried because it was a mm-hmm. sad thing. In that sharing, however, it was his deathbed regret. I'm still alive. What is it for me? It's a life lesson. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself and I said to my brother, thank you. I'm going to step out of this hospital room. I'm going to live my butt off because <laughs> I'm not going to go out like that. That was a horrible way for my brother to, to, to let go. It's like... I didn't give my life as fully as I know I could have. Right. This is why I think if we do embrace our death the way I have, Mm -hmm. our life can really take off like a shot. So about two years ago, a good friend of mine passed away, 71 Mm -hmm. years of age, and uh, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he did the exact opposite of your brother. He went, "Mm, nah, I'm not, you know... He's, he didn't even use the term fight. Yeah. Uh, he told his son, "When I, uh, if you have some kind of celebration of life for me, I don't want any military metaphors. I didn't go to battle. I didn't fight. I didn't do any of these things. He was at that place in his mind where he went, yeah, I lived the life that I wanted to, yeah. and uh, I'm ready to go. He requested the uh, assisted uh, dying papers, yeah. but he had already willed himself to go before they even arrived. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a peaceful place to be. You bet. And he's still my friend. Yeah. You bet he is. What was his name? Gordon. Gordon Finley. Yeah. I still miss him. Yeah, I bet you do. But he's still with me. Yeah. So nothing much has changed. The impact that he's had on me in my life. And so therefore, you know, yeah. his life has meaning and it carries on. Big time. So <laughs> you go through this with, with your brother. Yep. Still, psychologically, you say you reach that point where you go, okay, I'm willing to accept that I am going to die. I'm still not quite there. I'm trying to pretend that I'm going to live to be 100 and I'm going to be as healthy as I am now. (laughs) Good luck, and you may. Well, mm, probably not the lifestyle I'm living, but... uh, It's a process, though. Yeah. We need to be a bit gentler with ourselves that, okay, I'm walking along this line. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm walking towards it. And give yourself some credit for walking towards because most people just turn and mm-hmm. look away because it's so daunting. Well, you know, the, the loss of my mother led me on this discovery of, well, what's the meaning of life? I yeah. discovered uh, Leo Buscaglia, yeah. Leonardo Felice Buscaglia. <laughs> and he would talk on He talked about Elizabeth Kubler Ross yeah. and her, you know, five stages of, of dying. Yeah. Uh, death on her book, what was on death and dying? Yep. So, what are those stages? Well, uh, I'm not a big stage believer. I look for markers. First and foremost is usually denial. Right behind it is anger. Then comes the process of accepting. And then comes the process of the death and then the grieving. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of a... But they're interchangeable, aren't they? Totally. There's no straight line. Like a lot of people ask me, what's the straight line? And I've got to be honest with them, there isn't one. They're going to be all over the place. and, and, And we ought to be because we've been affected by it. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare said it so elegantly. He said, parting is such sweet sorrow, sweetness, spirit, sorrow, humanness. Mm -hmm. And it's that journey between the spirit and the humanness that we get all messed up on. This is our second break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So there's some practical sides to dying, too. We still have a responsibility to the fact that, you know, we have to have our affairs in order. We have to, because to just leave somebody, there's a fellow that I know who, um, uh, through uh, complications associated with a... uh, an operation wound up being a paraplegic. And he went, wow. you know, I went to sleep and woke up in my worst nightmare. I wish they let me die. And 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 for months and months and months, he said, you know, I wish I was dead. Yeah. And, uh, and so I was talking to him. And I said, well, you could always do that. And he said, no, I can't because I would then be involving somebody else. I still have a responsibility to those who are wow. living. Wow. He said, it wouldn't matter whether or not I got on an airplane and went to Switzerland or if I, you know, uh, whatever I did, I'm involving somebody else. And he said, that's not fair. 
Wow. And so, so that we, even though we're dying, we still have a responsibility to have our affairs in order. Big time. And you've got to put together all ready to to go binder I for did. you know on on what we need to know uh, about preparing for our death. Well, I know that you've got quite a number of points in there. What are the essential ones, and and how do we get started? Get your will done. Hmm. Right. Secondly, get a representation agreement signed. If I lose the capacity to speak for myself to the medical system, mm-hmm. I need to appoint somebody to speak to them on my behalf. Is that a power of attorney? Nope. No? It's called a representation agreement. The power of attorney is financial. Okay. So power of attorney gives my rep financial say over my assets. Okay. My health care needs, my health say is through a representation agreement. It's, are there ones online that yep. you can download and yep. from your website? Or go do you to, have a website? I do, but go yeah. to the Ministry of Health. Okay. They've got the representation agreement. They've got the whole My Voice piece, mm-hmm. which is a 56-page book of bureaucraties. It's difficult to get through, but it's helpful. Yeah. So appoint somebody to talk to you medically. Yeah. Then tell them through your advanced care directives what you want and don't want from the medical system and be precise. Oh, so precision matters. Sure. I mean, I can say to the medical system, no heroic measures. Mm -hmm. For them, CPR and resuscitation isn't a heroic measure. But you may see it as such. I may see it as such. So I've got to Ah. articulate clearly what I want and what I don't want. Mm -hmm. So in in my advanced care directors, I said, look, if I can't breathe for myself, don't breathe me. If I can't eat for myself, don't intubate me. Mm -hmm. Don't keep me alive. No CPR. Don't resuscitate me. Let me go. It's very clearly laid out. Right. My what wife... About, what about pain? I'd like my pain managed. Yes. But not to the extent that it's going to prolong unnecessarily my life. Mm-hmm. Let's just manage the pain. Improve what quality of life you have. Exactly. My <laughs> wife, on the other hand, just a little aside, she wants to be kept alive for 29 days. I don't know why 29 days, mm-hmm. but she said in her advanced care directives, plug me in. Do CPR, do all this stuff, keep mm-hmm. me alive. Yep. If after 29 days, there's been no change, no progress, end it, pull the plug and let me go. Now that's that, her. That's precision. That's precision. Yes. And that's her wish. Very mm-hmm. different than mine, but it's her wish all the same. So huh. those, okay, right? those pieces of precision are important. So that's in your interaction with the healthcare system. Yep. But what else do I need to do to make sure that I'm not burdening those that I'm leaving behind? Talk with them. Mm-hmm. I've had a meeting with my boys. They're 24 and 26. I call my all-ready-to-go binder my death binder. Mm-hmm. So I invited Ollie and Ben over. We sat around the kitchen table, and the death binder's on the table. <laughs> Oliver goes, Dad, what's that? You know? yeah, right. And um, I know my boys didn't want to talk with me about the end of my life. Mm-hmm. But it's coming maybe not as soon as they would like because right. I got some insurance money for them. <laughs> not but as soon as they would like. <laughs> it, it's coming. Yeah. So we, we had some beer, we had some pizza, and we sat down, we spoke about it. We walked through the power of attorney and the will yeah. and the rep agreement and the advanced care directors. My wife is younger than me significantly, so those three will be left taking care of my assets. Third and final break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Okay, so you talk, I, I'm going to run out of time really yep. easily here, but you talk about the fact that there's over 900,000 people, 60-plus yeah. in, yeah. in the province. Uh, should I be reserving my spot with the, with the uh, funeral director? Uh, I would think so. And, uh, I would you know, think and so. Where, you, know, you know, what I want to have done with, with my remains. And, and all, yep. do I need to literally make a reservation? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way, but when you look at it demographically, Get your funeral arrangements made. That's part of this book is, is to mm-hmm. make your funeral arrangements and find a funeral home that you feel comfortable with that's going to serve your needs, not necessarily their programs that they have for sale. Right. So because once you start to clear the 70 and 80 uh, you know, year mark, uh, you're probably not going to like be living at full health and then bang, die one day. That's right. There's going to be a long taper down. That's right. What about if there's that many people, what are we going to do about having the kind of health care assistance that's required to be able to uh, 
uh, at least have some quality of life when we're... My feelings, too, is the healthcare system isn't going to be able to take care of all of us. So who is? Our neighbors. Uh -huh. I have this belief, and I've sent 57 letters off to 57 mayors in British Columbia about four years ago. Mm -hmm. Death, a community development opportunity. I think we could use the end of life wow. as an opportunity to grow deeper and more meaningful relationships with our neighbors. My wife's going to need some help when her mom and her dad who live with us die and when I die. Yes. She's going to need somebody to come and take care of the cats. She's going to need somebody to take care of her. That might be our neighborhood. What a radical idea that we ha that we help one another. Is that <laughs> not though? Is that not the antithesis of the way that we're going from yes. a societal point of view? Yep. And you know, I, we've done a fair bit of work over the years uh, in our company around the idea of frailty. And yep. one of the components of frailty is isolation. Yep. And and as we age, people tend to become more isolated. So how do we overcome the inertia of that isolation? I walk up to my neighbor's house and I knock on the door often. I, I <laughs> so say, you insist. I insist. <laughs> you impose yourself upon I do. them. Yeah. And I've got neighbors down the street. There's the mom and dad, right? <laughs> okay, but look at you. I mean, you've got a big bright smile yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, eyes that are alive and your skin I looks know. great and all that. What happens when you've got somebody who is unhappy? And, and how do we get to them? How do we help those people? Just get like this. Yeah. I walk down to the end of my street. I'm on a cul-de-sac. There's an old family in the corner. Mm -hmm. Grandma, Grandpa on the main floor, Mom and Dad on the top floor, and they got two kids. Yeah. I know them well because I see the old guy walking every day. Yeah. And he's getting more and more frail. So I get to know the boys, and we yeah. wrestle and play. So when Grandma or Grandpa die, and Mom and Dad, who are the sandwich generation, have to take care of them, yeah. I got the boys. Come on down to my place. We'll have a pajama party and a sleepover. I think mm. that's what's required. You're reminding me of my friend Gordon Finley again, because um, when he was much younger in life, his neighbor was considerably older than him. Yeah. And uh, he, in large part, became her caregiver. Neighbor. Yeah. Not yeah. related. Um, and they had a fabulous uh, relationship yeah. as a result of that. Yeah. Quite extraordinary. This is what I'm encouraging. Yeah. We don't have enough long-term care beds, 28,000. We don't have enough hospital beds, 11,000. We don't have enough hospice beds. We have 260 palliative beds in all of BC mm -hmm. for a million baby boomers. It's, we just don't have this, the space or the capacity. We do in our neighborhoods, though, mm -hmm. and everybody's got a bed. It becomes incumbent upon us to make sure that we're preparing for it so that we don't get caught by surprise. And, it, and dying shouldn't be a surprise <laughs> because we've all encountered or uh, crossed right. paths with death along the way. Yeah. But it, if, we, if we don't do so, we're going to create a tremendous number of burdens. Yep. Yep. Yeah. For every one person that dies, eight people are affected. Do we want to yeah. affect them positively and uplift them with our death? Or do we want to affect them negatively? and burden them with our death. That's our personal choice. I'm choosing the uplifting side. Me too. Thank you for coming in and sharing Stu, this with you. us. Stu, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it very much.